less robotic audio. Definitely say some words so we can test out your end. All right, so I see us now on Twitch testing the audio. It's perfect. Yeah, all right. Um, for the record, I had to change everything to default on OBS for your, your audio settings. So. Okay. You know, fuck us. I think so. Sideways. Okay. You know, fuck us. All right, let's do the audio, uh, Audacity link up live for everyone. Sounds good. Sounds giddy. Okay. All right. You're, you're seeing behind the scenes magic here. Oh, yeah. All right, ready? Oh, yeah. All right. One, two, three. Okay, Audacity's running. Twitch is finally running correctly. And let us formally welcome you back to another episode of After the Act, a film podcast where we talk about movies and shows that we like. We are your hosts. I am Grandissimo, here with... Gladstastic. Ooh, in Gladstastic, we have a lovely, lovely return to form episode for everyone where we tackle... The Conjuring, The Devil Made Me Do It. So we're going to dive into uh, some spookiness, some overall thoughts of this film and the film franchise as a whole. And then we're going to get into some nitty gritty spoilers a little bit later. So um, first of all, welcome back, man. It's been a while since we, we bumped an ATA. It's been a minute. It's true, man. We've uh, we've been gone on hiatus. This happens to us quite often. And uh, we keep finding out ways to like talk about it and be like, how do we become more consistent? Um, and it, it always works out for a while and then something happens in life where we're just like, oh man, I can't do this stuff. Anymore. Anyways, you don't need to know any about that, anything the, about the that. The devil we made, made are, us not do it. That's what happened. It was the, the, devil. the devil. Yeah. The devil made us not do it. Um, but, uh, it's great to be back, man. It has been too long for my liking. I absolutely love talking about all of these movies. Every time we, we do one of these episodes, especially scary ones, man, like yeah. that's our bread and butter, like horror, man, just all day. Just eat it up. It could be. It could be. It could be something awful like Leprechaun, and we'll still spend over an hour and a half talking about it. So, great to be back, man. How have you been? I've been Tell the good. audience. I've been good. Also, I think it might. Be, Leprechaun might be the last ATA we had. So maybe that was a. Uh, it took all. It took our tank out to empty. Um, that happened. That's true, actually, because <laughs> I remember last time we did the Ginger Dead Man one. I there was. I needed rest. My mind needed rest. <laughs> From the rotting that had occurred, it's, uh, so it, it might have been it might have been that. You're right, <laughs> um, but yeah, it's been like you know things are opening up. We're vaxxed up. We're waxed up. So it's been good diving back into some socializing and going back to the movie theaters. I I saw this in a movie theater, which is insanity to me. I haven't been to the movies uh, prior to these last few since February of 2020. I think it was like might have been Frozen was the last one I saw in theaters or. Uh, that other Pixar movie. Um, so it's, it, it felt good just going into a theater, buying some overpriced popcorn and drinks, uh, having like a beer, putting the seat up. Like it's been it's been a good return to how I love seeing movies, which is in a big ass theater with some dope ass seats and snacks. It's been good. man. Now, remember, if you had AMC stock, you would have gotten a free large popcorn. Mm hmm. Mm, so nice. shout outs to the shout outs to Wall Street Bets and uh, that whole Reddit team because uh, they're they're banking on uh, on AMC right now. I mean, at least yeah, they work. it's it's put it's it's put in work for people. It put in. I haven't looked at what it is now, but you know, power power to the meme, power to the meme. Power I'm to all, the meme. I'm all for it. The system is flawed exactly. and empty. It means nothing. So. <laughs> Boost up whatever the hell you want. Listen, our my goal is to become a meme. I'd love to be memeized, as the kids say. Oh yes, yes. Well, you know, one or is day. it or is it memeized? <laughs> I don't know. That sounds dirtier. I like it. Uh, the dirtier, the better. The filthier, the better. The the more sins, the better. Um, and I think that's exactly where uh, um, James Wan wanted for this franchise too. They just they're trying to get more sinful every time, and I, I I'm here for it. I'm here for it. Um. So I agree. The Conjuring, the Devil Made Me Do it, it. Do it. It's the third main Conjuring film in the franchise, and uh, what is it like the seventh or so overall film? I lost count at this point. I, uh, I think either six or seven, right? Because you had three Annabelle eight. movies, 
three conjurings. The two conjurings. La Llorona, the nun. The La- nun. Oh, I always forget about La Llorona because that was such a bad movie. Is this a um, So, one? yeah, this, this would be the eighth one, yeah. Huh. Well, a lot in the bag. Um, and honestly, I've only seen about half of them. Um, I've seen all the main conjurings and Annabelle and a nun. Um, so I haven't seen them all. So it's interesting going into this movie and just seeing it's been a while for the conjuring that I, I was like two states ago when the conjuring two came out, it might've been what 2015, 2016, that one came out. So it's been a while yeah. uh, since we saw these classic devil hunters here, but um, yeah. What's, what's your, uh, what's your feeling on this franchise? It's one of the few horror franchises actually putting out some consistent movies. So what's, what's your view on the franchise and then what's your overall thoughts on this movie? Well, okay. So for the overall franchise, I always get excited when I can have something to look forward to consistently for horror films that's actually enjoyable. Uh, for me, personally, I know the last, I think the last real horror series that we had in recent memory was the Saw series. Correct me if I'm wrong on this, but that's what I remember. And those movies were always very repetitive and very boring for me. Um, so... It kind of left a bad taste in my mouth when it came to like, building a universe with a horror film. Uh, and then this movie came out. And I remember, I think the first Conjuring came out in like, 2013, 2014, something like that. Um, and it was, the, it was a delightful surprise because at the time, I don't remember there being a lot of hype for the first Conjuring movie. Like I saw a trailer. Um, James Wan did it. And I know you and I love James Wan from Insidious and Dead Silence. Like Those were... Really cool movies were like, okay, this will be probably very similar uh, in style, but we really like those movies, so we're looking forward to this. I wasn't expecting much. I knew about Ed and Lorraine Warren before this because there was a great show, I believe on AMC in the early 2000s called Paranormal State, and it was about like Penn State's paranormal investigation team, um, and they did cases, and they would occasionally have Lorraine Warren uh, as a psychic on those cases. Um, and I was a big fan of like haunted dolls, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I knew about the Annabelle case and the attachment of the Warrens to that case as well. Um, which I didn't even really know, uh, not Annabelle, but there's another haunted doll called, called Robert the doll, um, who inspired Chucky, uh, the movie Chucky. So, um, I knew a little bit going in and I thought that added to the cool factor cause they could actually say this time, Hey, this is based on a true story, and I would actually believe that it was mostly based on a true story versus like taking snippets of like a serial killer and adding it to a movie and then completely fictionalizing everything else, making it based on a true story. Um, so I was looking forward to it. I saw the movie and I shit my pants, man. It was horrifying. Like that movie actually scared me, um, which is something that doesn't happen a lot anymore. But that first Conjuring movie was was horrifying. It it took a bunch of old tropes from horror films that i thought wouldn't scare me anymore and it just added just something a little bit different to it and i think it kind of breathed life into those old techniques that a lot of old horror films would use so you could definitely tell james wan loved what he did like he loves the genre of horror um it's really it's really what he focused on a majority of his his early film career um so it was really cool to see someone with that much reverence and respect for horror taking real cases from these these two investigators from the 70s 80s etc and portray them in such a like unique way um so the first conjuring movie was amazing i I always rate that one at least eight and a half out of ten but it always varies between eight and a half and nine which is amazing for horror films second conjuring film wasn't as taken back there were some weird things with cgi that i really didn't enjoy um but overall, the franchise has always been very, very enjoyable for me. Um, except Annabelle 2. I'm looking at you, Annabelle 2. You were not very good. Um, so, besides that movie and La Llorona... For, see, I, for, I even forget about La Llorona because I just did not enjoy that movie. But besides those two, every film was at least very solid for me. Um, at least a 6 out of 10. So, my overall interpretation of the franchise is everyone should at least give it a chance if you like horror um don't expect anything too crazy in terms of like over the top nonsense um they tend to stay grounded in the reality of like your technical like possession type of movie 
or evil spirits type of movie, but it's just the style. The style is very cool for these films. Um, so if you're into the genre, definitely check them out at least once. Um, and in terms of not just the universe, but the three main Conjuring films that kind of you know created this whole universe, for me, and we'll get into the specifics a little bit later, I really enjoyed the first one. I thought the second one was not as not as good as the first one. Um, if I could rate it, I would say six and a half, seven out of ten compared to the eight and a half, nine out of ten of the first one. And then this one, um, and very few times do we get to say this for any genre, especially horror. I thought the third one was at least better than the second one. Um, still not as good as the first, but the third one was not the worst. Um, so I would rate. I'll tell you what my rating is at the end of this episode because we tend to save it for the end. But overall, very enjoyable universe. You could do far worse in horror when it comes to, to movies. And uh, it even made me want to learn more about the cases after these films. So check it out. Yeah, very fair take. Um, yeah, I felt like the Conjuring universe really just gave new life to the horror genre that felt needed. Um, you know, we definitely got some heaters in terms of like good horror and thriller films when you come to, when it comes to like hereditary or the get out us franchises um so and I, I really do think the conjuring kind of boosted the morale of people wanting to see horror again um and then james wan yeah he's our boy um i think his first movie he directed was saw uh, which you know say, say what you will about the franchise but it's like a long-standing franchise and that first movie i do actually enjoy it's a really quiet fucked up horror film and you can go from he can go from horror porn gore porn to something as traditional as the conjuring and that's what i i liked about the first conjuring i didn't even see it in theaters i think i saw it when it came on like netflix or something but i wasn't excited for it in theory because it was a haunted house movie i was like how how can you do anything different that i haven't seen 27 different times with a haunted house movie and it was interesting it, it felt like watching like a like a master swordsman, you know, like a really ancient weapon. It's just nothing crazy about a sword, but someone <laughs> like wielding it with like Roni Kenshin anime level of skill. It's like, wow, he took this simple tools in terms of haunted house, you know, creepy atmosphere, jump scares, creepy lore, family dynamic coming together. He took that and just elevated it to master levels with the first movie. Um, and that's, Really, the the flavor of a lot of these movies were are their traditional horror scares, but a lot of them are just done really, really well, which I appreciate. Um, and that first Conjuring, like that's definitely the best film of the franchise. I I've seen about I think five out of the eight of them, uh, but that one is hard to touch. It's just hard for any other horror movie that's not something like Hereditary to even surpass the Conjuring in the last fifteen twenty years. Um, I've seen uh, Conjuring 2. It was definitely less than Conjuring 1, but I still liked it. My only criticism really was those weird CG moments where it's like, you didn't, you didn't need that. But other than that, like, it's not only even the horror elements that draws me to specifically the Conjuring movies, but I feel like they cast it all so well. Um, every Conjuring, I, I feel like the casting is usually the strongest part uh, right next to the atmosphere they set up because um, you have... Patrick Wilson as Ed Warren and Vera as as Lorraine I'm like that's they have the most perfect dynamic I've seen for like a couple especially a couple on a in a horror movie they they're they gave this horror franchise an actual heart and it is that Warren family um because even like um I mean we'll get into spoilers later but for the Conjuring 2 spoiler for all the Conjuring movies um, but you just have that kind of through line of watching their marriage kind of evolve and like when it, things can get unstable, like usually it's, you know, it, it can feel almost cheesy, but to me it works of like their love really carries what their work is. So they can only really help people because they love each other so much. So they just believe in, in each other. So it's weird for it to have so much like heart in these kind of horror movies, but it does. And that's what endears me to this franchise. Um, I'll say that this movie in particular was also it's it's pretty good it's pretty good i think i like it the least out of the main conjuring one two and threes uh this one and number two are really close there might be just like half a point difference um but all in all it still had some really good scares it had some really good horror elements um the lore was interesting to dive into and then again the heart of the movie being the warrens marriage really 
shine again. They did some similar techniques to show like how deep their relationship goes and how much they still care for each other. And the relationship was definitely tested in this movie. Um, but it ends in a pretty good way overall. So it's another it's another good installment. Um, I haven't seen the last two Annabelle movies. I've seen The Nun. The Nun is fine. You know, like it's a fine entry into a horror movie. Um, it's not really good, but it's not really bad. It's just right in the middle. Uh, I did not like that first Annabelle movie, the one that came out, I think, in 2014. Um, it's, I think it's, for me, out of the five I've seen, it's the worst one of the Conjuring movies. But I haven't seen Annabelle 2 or the third one or La Ladona because I refuse to see that one based off even what you just told me. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, I like I want this franchise to keep going for another 10 years. I know they have like a... It's like what they're doing is what we want to do <laughs> with like our own careers. If we grow up to films, like have this horror world and be able to spin off other movies based off of the elements in there. Like it seems like a cash grab, but it's like, that's fine. Like I love that kind of world building. It works for Marvel. And this is the only other universe I can say actually works for too. When you just spin off new characters, new lores, uh, new stories. So uh, this movie, very solid. If you like the Conjuring movies at all, definitely see the Conjuring three. Um, and unless there's anything else, we can just dive into some spoilers for the conjuring. The devil made me do it. Uh, I would say there's just a catch to something you said. You said the, the casting was really good. Um, it might've been too good because they, um, they casted two very attractive people to play Ed and Lorraine Warren. And I don't want to, I don't like call people ugly, right? Cause beauty's an eye. The, 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 the side by side into- stills of the original. Yeah. They, they're different. <laughs> They're yeah, they're, you know, <laughs> less snacky for sure. Okay, that, that, that's all I'm going to say. Yeah, but for, for our preference. It was, yeah. They made them a little too sexy for these movies is all I'm saying. All right. Um, <laughs> and and then in this movie, and we can actually go into spoilers right now. So three, two, one. Blah, spoilers. So in this movie, they show Ed and Lorraine Warren when they're younger. And somehow they're more attractive when they're younger. Like the the young young Ed Warren is like model esque. It's ridiculous. I'm like, like it, it it kind of ruined it for me that I knew what they looked like in real life. Because when I saw that scene, I just I kind of chuckled. And it wasn't meant to be a chuckle moment. It was meant to be like this beautiful romantic scene. And I'm just like, get the fuck out of here. Though that that doesn't look anything like Ed Warren. I'm sorry. <laughs> Ed Warren just looked like this like. He looks season, different. He looks different. Season <laughs> New Yorker who just doesn't give a fuck kind of person. Um, not not the same as what you see in the movie, um, but that's fine. I, I you know I get actors are very attractive people. That's part of their profession. But um, in terms of the casting, um, the chemistry is great between those two, but it's not very accurate. So just keep. Oh yeah, and, and yeah, I have zero fucks about the accuracy of how like how less sexy the real head Warren is. Cause I, I like, I don't dive into the real Warrens at all. So I don't ever remember how they look like. And so in the credits, when they show the side by side and when they did it at the end, I was like, Oh, Oh, that's a different person. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's a highly different person. Um, but yeah, in terms of the their chemistry, it's like, I don't, I don't want to see any other couple on a film when I, I'm watching these two Patrick and Vera work. I'm like, you guys must be fucking all the time. Just like holding hands and fucking. Cause your chemistry I don't know how it could be better if you haven't been doing that for years already. Um, and it just like warms my heart. Anytime they have one of those loving scenes, like flashbacks of them, you know, meeting each other at a movie theater and then uh, the whole like gazebo callbacks and when they first show it, I'm like, I, it's just, I'm a sucker for that. They, they, they sucked me into it. I loved it. Um, and they, they have a bunch of those cute moments in, in all the conjuring movies, cute. right? Yeah. Cause there's, there's at least one in, most of the movies, actually, not even just The Conjuring, the Annabelle, one of the Annabelle movies does this too. I think it's uh, Annabelle Comes Home. The They'll always have at least one scene where one or the other is talking about something they did when they were younger. And then another character will be like, oh, what does Mr. or Mrs. Warren think of that? They're like, oh, it was them. And so they, they have these cute little moments that they insert to add charm into the movies. And uh, in this one, they just kind of give you a little bit more. They show them in an actual flashback. Yeah, they're like completely charming. Like It's just like... I want to marry both of them. That's this is how much that's just how much they ooze that that drip of charm. Uh, so that's definitely and that I think was probably my favorite 
parts of this movie actually was just their chemistry. So not only like their cute love moments, um, them trying to save, literally save each other from all the fucked up cult stuff that was happening in this movie, but really just their dynamic. Like I think the the casting, the actors, they they all carried this movie. Uh, they all, if it wasn't these actors and these roles, I, it couldn't have been a good movie in my opinion without them holding it down and elevating every scene. So even if some scenes for me didn't hit so hard, you know, Patrick or Vera were in the scene to elevate it to two more grades. So, uh, yeah, they were integral in this movie. So I, every every scene with them, I mean, even them interacting with other characters, it's just it was great. Yeah, and I, I really love that scene where at the end of uh, when we'll get into the climax of the film, but it's after the climax you find out Ed Warren has heart problems because he's older, and you know, doing a job like this takes his toll on your body. Um, and he has this moment where he forgets his nitro pill, right? And they, they like briefly insert a moment in the in like a previous part of the film where he doesn't tell Lorraine about having to take nitro pills and she's kind of pissed at him. She's like, Oh, why didn't you tell me? And he was just like, well, I just I forgot or I forget what he says actually, but he was like he forgot just, to bring them. And she's like, Don't do that again. And he's like, I know. Ex- I know. Ex- exactly, exactly. And then he forgets to bring them. It looks like he's about to have another heart attack. And then she has it on like the little heart locket, and I just oh my god, my heart melted. It was adorable. Yeah, and I like I can totally see someone else reading that as like cheesy and like too on the nose of like he she literally had his heart pills in her heart necklace. That's there's a lot of on the nose stuff. I don't give a shit. I loved it. It, it just it melted. It <laughs> melted goals. all the feels. Yeah, <laughs> it's goals, baby. Literally had her heart pills in her heart locket, um, and that was like you know her great great mood of uh like yeah like i'm here for you like i'm literally gonna hold you down even if you're swinging a sledgehammer at me like i'm always gonna think about you um and then you know i guess staying on the topic of cute things they did um showing them like their you know the first interaction was under a gazebo when they were young after a movie theater or a a dinner date and then for him to bring uh to buy and make a replica of that gazebo as a present for her like all right come on Come like I I kind of saw that coming like they always do a really obvious callback but it always works for me that worked for me too I was like ah, that's fucking sweet so I want my partner to build me a gazebo that's the exact one we first like held each other when we were young it's beautiful I it's those moments I'm like I, I could just watch them be cute together for like ninety minutes and I'd be happy you know what they have to do I mean it, I'm surprised they haven't even talked about doing this is like a like a prequel series of when they were younger with those two younger actors, them like getting into paranormal investigation and not being the seasoned vets that they are in these films where, you know, they're figuring it out. Like, how do you do an exorcism? How do you, how do I, Lorraine being like, how do I use my powers properly? You know, intro cases. I think that would be really cool. You could even do that as a show and it'd be pretty successful. Like young Ed and Lorraine Warren. I absolutely agree. I think that's a, a green light that idea. I love it. Cause that'd be perfect. Cause they even now they're still like they they fumbled through this case. They weren't able to be helpful immediately. It was a struggle for them. And most of these movies have that. Like oh they're struggling. And then you know classic. How do we do it? We figure it out. But yeah, them year one. You know like year one Batman, but year one uh, Warrens. Just like I completely fucked that spell up. That kid is possessed for life. All right, we got to move on. You gotta. <laughs> uh, I'd be all. And not all that. winners. Yeah, not not yeah. all of them. <laughs> um, but and, yeah, and I, I go for it. No, oh, I was just gonna say I love the little touches in this film too because they do callbacks to the previous films, and um, you know, obviously they they like to do their callbacks in the 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 trophy room, so to speak, where they keep all the haunted items. Um, but there was a, an additional point point in this movie where they uh get a letter from the parent family saying thank you and that they hope they're doing well. And the parent family is the family from the first Conjuring film. So it's kind of cool that they did that callback. Um, it just kind of adds a little bit more detail, makes it a little bit more real. Um, and you could definitely tell that that was like a James Wan touch, I think, like right there. That's 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 his yeah. signature. Yeah. And I, 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 I appreciate those nods, too. And a lot of them, some of them are pretty overt, but it's like it's fun because fans of the franchise who are aware of all these different lores and characters and families um like the classic scene of like the most classic callback scene was them arguing with the lawyer about her using 
uh, being possessed as, as, by a demon as an actual argument to bring into the court. And she very, you know, realistically is like, what the fuck are you talking about? No, like, I'm not going to do that. And in this universe, you know, we're seeing it from the lens of the Warrens of all this being true. So in this universe, they're like, well, you know, come to the house. We'll make you dinner, you know, show you Annabelle, see how you feel. And then it's just a straight dry cut scene to her just kind of still shook in a courtroom, just immediately being like, yeah, we're going with a possessed by demon argument here. And it got, I got a laugh from everyone in the audience. This, the, the understanding of Annabelle and how that might, might change your, uh, your view of things in this universe. Yeah. You don't fuck with Annabelle. Okay. I mean, I have my gripes with that second film. The first film is not perfect either. Actually, I think I enjoy the third Annabelle film the most, honestly. Um, but say what you will, Annabelle is terrifying. Even the case in real life of Annabelle is terrifying. Um, so I love that they use that as a mechanism for getting the lawyer on board with with uh, possession. Because lawyers are very... Listen, the, present, the, the, the profession of a lawyer is one of logic, and it's one of evidence, right? It's about facts. So the fact that they could turn a, a somebody who's inherently got a cynical profession, or they need a cynical mindset for a profession, to immediately change their opinion, uh, especially for a defense is awesome like i yeah, thought funny. that was hilarious it's pretty funny um and i think what the conjuring does well usually too is you have the main worn through line of their love but they always introduce a family that you sympathize with too so they introduce this new you know young couple um and the opening scene was really good too how do you feel about the opening scene they started with honestly i think it's my favorite opening scene out of all three movies yeah. um because they I think um, I think we saw this more with Insidious, especially I think the second Insidious movie, which is by far the worst one, um, where they'll start immediately in a case, like you'll be thrown into the into like the end of a case or the middle of a case, um, and I think that's the first time they do it with The Conjuring, from what I remember. Um, but I thought it was the perfect way to build tension um, because. After the first two films, you see what the Warrens kind of have dealt with already in their career. You're like, oh man, You're like what could possibly be so crazy about what they're gonna encounter for future cases? And this just kind of like throws you for a loop because in the beginning you see it looks like a you know it looks like a standard exorcism. I put that in quotations, um, but in reality, it like flips on its head. And it's this little boy who's being possessed and they can't do shit for him. Like they are failing hard. And normally Lorraine Warren's able to do more because of her psychic abilities. But in this one, she gets kind of nullified, right? In the beginning, she just kind of gets paralyzed by visions that she's receiving. And it does like nothing. She does works. Nothing. Patrick Wilson is doing works. Um, and at the end, it's just the main character of the film uh, who I forget his character name because um, Glatzel's the young boy. Uh, um, but what's the name? Is it Arnie? Is that the Arnie? Right? Yeah. Yep. So it's Arnie. And he's the boyfriend of the sister yeah. of the little boy who's possessed in the beginning of the film. And he takes it upon himself to do the standard exorcism trope where he's like, take me instead, have me instead. And that's a huge mistake because the demon takes him up on that offer and he ends up getting possessed and it leaves the little boy's body. And so Ed and Lorraine Warren, um, you know, everyone thinks that the case is over, um, except for Ed, Ed Warren. He sees what happens, but he's unable to vocalize what happens because he suffers a massive heart attack. Um, and that, you know, comes up later in the film. But just the tone of this little boy like being possessed and writhing in pain and twisting his joints all back and forth. It was very exorcism esque. And I think it was the perfect way to set the tone because even the scene where the priest is pulling up in the car and stands in front of the house, that's like a standard, that's a very famous scene from the exorcist, the movie, the exorcist. Yeah. So they were able to kind of take again, older tropes and present them in a new light to make them fresh. And I thought that was just a brilliant way to start this movie. Yeah, exactly what you said. Like it's that's their biggest strength is they don't really introduce new tropes, I feel. There's nothing 
innovative like I felt maybe Hereditary did with like the slow burn background scares. Conjuring is very traditional, but traditional in the best way possible. Like there's a reason a lot of horror movies started with those tropes is because those were legitimately scary, but they've been done so much in much worse ways over the years. But yeah, they definitely elevate it. And that first scene, it, it, nothing really more to add. It's perfect. It's the classic, like something's possessed. Things are going not that well. And it just the contortions, the the drama of everything. And then you have Ed go down with a heart attack, which is like, oh, shit. Like one, one of the Warrens are down right now during all this. So not only do they feel yeah. like helpless and trying to help the boy, but the, physically they're becoming, you know, less healthy themselves. Um, and I love that they set that up for new stakes for those main characters of like they're physically vulnerable. They've always been vulnerable in all these movies, but you can see it taking an actual toll on their body, on their psyche. Uh, it's interfering with their work. So I like that. It's new stakes for those main characters. And uh, uh, while we run through these tragic new stakes for these new characters, because now you have um, Arnie uh, in you know, the next scenes possessed and he's trying to get back, you know, it's, you know, uh, wants to move away with his girlfriend, Debbie, I think. Um, you know, trying to save up more money. There's, there's going through classic young couple stuff, which is all sweet. Um, and then for the demon to keep kind of haunting him a little bit more, a little bit more to the point where it possesses him and then it causes him to stab his landlord. Was it 22 times? I think. Um, yeah. Something which, absurd. Yeah. It was, it's just like <laughs> really, really fucked. And you know, this is all in the lens of this being true in the universe, but it's like it's such a fucked up tale to be like, um, yeah, you know, I was possessed and stabbed my landlord. Now I'm facing the death penalty. So like the, the stakes are extremely high because not only is the demon a threat, but they're, you know, they're learning about its cult ties, um, how many people might be involved that might die from this. And then literally, you know, the, the justice system of they're probably going to kill this young man, uh, if they can't prove that he was actually possessed. So, um, a lot of I, I love the stakes. I, I'd, I'd really like the young couple too. They seem like a classic young couple in love. They had pretty good chemistry. I enjoyed uh, Arnie's performances of like even going through things like insomnia because he can't sleep because of all the things he's been seeing and he's been haunted constantly. So there was a good, uh, good new set of problems for a new set of characters of like, all right, facing the death penalty. Haven't seen that yet for the Conjuring verse. Like. Uh, how can you save me? Also, I'm going crazy. And yeah, it, it was a good, good set of new characters they introduced with some fucked up problems. Absolutely. Um, and they were in typical Danny Glover form. We have to find a way to sque squeeze that into this episode where he's just like, I'm getting too old for this shit. <laughs> uh, classic line is exactly what's happening to the Warrens, uh, which is cool because they actually use, um, instead of brute forcing their way like they, they typically do in the Conjuring films where they'll just do like a big exorcism at the end um, and cast the demon out. This one was a little more nuanced. They had to do their research extensively. They needed a squad to help them. They actually had to travel and gather information, uh, which is something you don't see in the first two Conjuring films. You actually see them be actual investigators uh, first and foremost in this movie, which is cool. Um, so I did appreciate that. Um, one of the things that I thought was it kind of took away from this film is is a few things right the first thing is the main facts of the case right were were all in all mentioned but i feel like they had a dilemma with this movie right because the way it was presented in the trailer you honestly thought they would focus more on the trial right because that is really important that's a that's a great historical piece that i feel wasn't really touched that much on in the movie where it was one of the first few times where demonic possession was used in a U.S. court case. And I thought for sure that was the direction they were going to go into. They were going to focus more on the courtroom drama aspect of it and maybe use flashbacks to kind of enhance the experience of, of, the, of the horror. Um, and then maybe have one or two parts where they'll jump out of the courtroom and do other things for the case. But... This one just kind of briefly stayed in the courtroom and they, they kind of strayed away from it to create this like alternate fictional um, threat of a black witch um, manipulating these, these you know, unfortunate families into essentially using themselves as sacrifice. That was the whole point of this movie. The witch was making a contract with a demon in order to gather souls for it and in return she would have power. Um, but 
knowing the facts of the case again kind of kind of took away from this experience because again most of the facts are about the case itself and anything that we saw about the witch was purely fictitious at least from my knowledge so that was interesting i can i can understand why they might have done that because if they focused more on the courtroom side of it it might have been too similar to a different movie called the exorcism of emily rose where that's what they did where it was mostly about the court case and then they used flashbacks to talk about the possession part um and that's still a fantastic movie but maybe they wanted to separate themselves from that and keep that like typical conjuring flair to it um but i thought it was it was kind of a weakness in this film um but i'm also very conflicted because i did like the originality of this movie where it wasn't a demon that was the main adversary it was actually a human this time and it was a human that had experience in the dark arts much like they have experience in exorcisms and being beacons of light for these unfortunate um families so i thought that was really interesting how you could have like a light and a dark side and there were, it was a very human opponent for the most part um which which was cool but i feel like at the it came at a cost and that cost was they strayed away from the facts of the case um so i don't know what the happy medium would have been there or if they made the right choice obviously i did enjoy the film but maybe it could have been better i don't know what do you think Sure. Yeah. And, and we definitely have different like spectrums of our um, investment in the actual stories of what happened with the Warrens. I have close to zero. So from my perspective, I was interested in the courtroom procedure. It could have been because it did set up of like, how can we prove in a court of law that a demon possessed this boy um, or at least give a reasonable doubt kind of thing to the juror. Um, so I was interested in that, but they don't touch that at all. They don't. That's not a part of it. It's maybe 4% of the movie is the core. Everything's set up of that. That's the stake of it. Um, but all you have is like the opening statement and then you have the allusion to the conclusion of the court at the end. So it's not a procedural, but it would have been, it would have been a bold move to go more court drama interspliced with the horror that they created. I don't think it would have been a better movie. I don't think, the general audience is coming into this movie looking to see a court procedural of demons. That would be interesting, but that would be immediately the criticism of like, I don't really want to see some kind of like better call Saul procedural happening in the conjuring movie. You want to see what you want to see before you want to see a couple of families trying to stave away whatever evil. So I think they probably made a good move um, in terms of like what the general audience would have wanted to come away with from this movie. Um, but I was curious. I really did think they were going to go into, at least at the end, uh, what actually happened in the court. But that it probably would have been too disconnected, ultimately. Um, um, yeah. And I would have yeah. I would have liked to have seen more about the little boy, too, because he's introduced in the beginning of the film. And that's a yeah. horrifying premise in itself, a young boy under demonic possession. And a majority of the cases about their uh, experiences with trying to help that little boy out. And they also barely touch on anything that happened to the little kid too yeah they kind of go right to arnie so it's like what like six months later after that initial possession um yeah they just go dive into the arnie thing uh, which is interesting because that's different they usually stick with like conjuring too they stuck with like the possessed kid and them just trying to help that possessed kid because kids being in danger it's definitely pulls on the heartstrings a little bit easier than you know young adults being possessed um but again me knowing nothing about the actual case which is how i try to keep it with these conjuring movies um it was fine i wanted to see more of the little kid they did have him in some flashbacks and stuff like that like that first time i think i've ever seen in all the hundreds of horror movies i've seen is uh a water bed being used as a, a horror that was cool prop that was really cool it was it was it was kind of perfect you have the classic little kids playing on a water bed he's kind of lying you know enjoying little waves and every now and then something will will kind of move in a way that doesn't mess with the that doesn't go with the flow uh, and to the point where he's kind of investigating and he just like sees like a there's like a face next to him. A hand comes out, grabs him. That was one of my favorite little scenes in terms of this pure horror. And it involved the little kid of like, that's great. What a great use of a waterbed. Best use of it. <laughs> in a horror I think it makes genre. it more horrifying. Yeah. yeah. Cause as a kid, at least, at least for myself, I always wanted a waterbed. I thought that was the coolest thing ever. Yeah. And as an adult now, I'm like, thank God I never had a waterbed cause that would have been hella uncomfortable. But as a kid, you're just like, that's dope. I like that sleeping on water. Hell yeah. Um, so it kind of adds to the terror aspect of, you know, kids 
being very excited for something and then it containing something very very evil um i did like that yeah and it's new like it's usually a classic like they use a toy or something or uh, a closet that's you know seems to be normal but then it seems spooky they use the waterbed great use of a new prop <laughs> in a classic trope and it felt kind of reminiscent of some, like nightmare of elm street scenes of like freddy coming out of the bed and pulling people into his dimension uh they had kind of those shots in there but with a water bed so cool <laughs> cool different one absolutely also shout outs to arnie arnie held off being possessed pretty good pretty well um because normally like in other horror films you see it being instantaneous again i'm no expert in actual exorcisms or demonic possession cases so i don't know how it is in real life i'm i could be completely talking out of my ass here but at least for the movie it was interesting that it was more progressive um he was able to stay firm pretty late into the movie um so Shout out to him just having incredible willpower and they kind of reinforce that idea because they keep showing him working very hard as a young man in the film, um, whether he's fixing a radio for spare change or if he's trimming a tree or working construction, whatever. He just he's portrayed as a very hard worker, someone who cares a lot about his loved ones. Um, so I think knowing that and then seeing how, how long he lasted before the climax of the film. He he did pretty well. So shout outs to Arnie. That's I mean that's that's an interesting note. That's fair. Um, I feel like most wh- horror movies though they usually do that right. Like someone's possessed, and then the progression of their possession getting worse is what carries the film. You know, like uh, like Hereditary. You know, the sp- minor spoilers, but you have some main characters who uh get worse over time. But yeah, it was done well with him. Like the progression of threats and. Even that final scene of like, first of all, his his girl held him down. <laughs> like Debbie held him the fuck down. Um, it was a good parallel for the Warrens. It was like yeah. the blossoming of love, like the Warrens had. Yeah, yeah, just as strong. And um, you know, I don't know how many people who would actually witness their boyfriend stabbing their landlord twenty two times, um, and then being like, you know what? I also do think it's a demon. I believe you. <laughs> that didn't seem like you. And then wait for him five years in prison and then get married while they're in prison. And I guess he's a real one. I'm telling you, <laughs> she 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 held him down. Um, I don't think I would instruct any of my friends to do that. But, you know, she did. She did. That's it was just pure love. That's all she saw was the love um, and the belief she had in a boyfriend. So, again, it was like, yeah, the Warren's in their twilight of their love versus this new one at the dawn of it. So that was also, yeah, a good parallel good pairing there and just her like literally stopping him from killing himself via the possession at the end with the like glass like just fucking pulling down on the arm to make sure that the demon didn't force him to slit his own throat uh that was great it was it was almost a little bit on the nose because he had obviously it was paralleling with the warrens who ed was possessed and trying to kill uh his wife with a sledgehammer so it was very like you know an obvious parallel uh, it, it was a little lukewarm in how I felt about that, you know, on the nose parallel, but it, it worked ultimately. Um, and it was it was cool to see that the Warrens can be as vulnerable as all these other regular pedestrians having Ed being possessed. And I I love the uh, I love the, uh, the the main villain because she was similar um to the Warrens, like like you said, like uh, Lorraine had a similar power as the Switch did where. It was almost like uh, some spoilers for Star Wars here, but the whole Kylo um, and Ray connection that they had, they had, they threw that in there like, oh, shit, it goes both ways. Like, if I see her, she sees me. Uh, Game of Thrones, same thing with, like, the White Walkers and uh, Bran Stark of the whole, like, oh, shit, it goes both ways now. Uh, so I enjoy they introduced, like, oh, a human who can also fuck with these dark arts, too, at, at the same proficiency. Um, and do stuff like tricking the Warrens into possessing one of the Warrens. Like, oh shit, they got you guys. Like, you don't have some kind of like weird spirit detect metal detector in your front door. Like, she, she's a savvy one, this villain. Um, so yeah, that was, and to actually see, like, we, we know the Warrens weren't going to die, but to see that, oh shit, Ed's actually might, he might kill Lorraine, and that would have been a tragic thing. Um, so I did enjoy those stakes to introduce stuff like the Warrens might kill each other in this instance um and it's all done by a you know pretty crafty human witchcrafty exactly. human. 
Yeah, and uh, I think one of the things that I thought was actually pretty cool uh, was the fact that they talked to this expert that was recommended by the priest in the film where he was he was someone who studied the order of the I think he said the goat or something like that the order of the goat yeah, something like or that. the order the of the ram. ram yeah yeah I'm looking at you LA fans um I don't trust you but what was interesting was was that was part of a callback too because in the first Annabelle film the yep. cultists who create Annabelle were from the order of the ram um and if you know they're in charge if they were responsible for making something as evil as annabelle who they to this day respect the shit out of and make sure annabelle's in like a very proper separate case that's constantly being blessed then it would make sense that someone from that order would also pose a great threat to them um later on in the film franchise so i thought that was really cool um and i also really like the fact that they don't give you a rhyme or reason as to why she picked those families to sacrifice Right, they they kind of say, okay, she needs she needs a lover, a seasoned lover, and she needs an innocent. But they never really discover why she chose those people specifically, or how she even obtained their information, which some people might have a problem with, right? Because some people really like loose ends being tied up, especially in horror films. But I think it works in this case because if you're talking about something like evil, evil is is very vague. It's very mystical, right? People. People see different things as evil, whereas other people might see them as as a good thing, right? It's very very arbitrary. And the fact that they said in the film that one of the hardest things to answer or one of the things that's not even important in knowing is the why. And I think that works for horror. I think it makes it a little more scary that you just don't understand why they chose these people, right? Was it... Was it something those people did? Is it just that these? It is just the message that evil can come for anyone at any time, and that's what makes it evil. Um, it's got like that whole facade, that whole mystifying aspect of it that even Hannibal Lecter has in Silence of the Lambs, where you don't know why he eats people until they introduce like the prequel film. But just looking at the original films, it makes it scarier, right? Like it adds to that passage in the Bible that says you know, the devil is out there looking for those whom he can consume, or like the devil is a, a lion amongst the sheep looking for he, he, those whom he can consume or something like that. It adds to that passage and it just shows that that's how evil works. It lurks around. You don't know why it does what it does, but it's there to fuck your day up essentially. And I, I thought that was pretty cool that they, they decided to go that route. Yeah, I can probably take or leave if they explained it or not. Um, Because I, even from a like a story perspective, um, most of the hauntings just kind of happen as like a force of nature. Um, This one was it felt a little different because there's the obvious human nature. Um, So it's like knowing human motivations can add to the story as well as to what were the underlying things those cult members felt to lead them to the set of people. Um, so I, I, I was slightly interested in that. Um, but knowing that these humans in this universe were kind of surrogates for devilish things anyways, it's not that important. It, it is it is kind of like a force of nature as to whom gets chosen. It's just, it happened. So I agree. It wasn't really that important. Um, I don't know. It it. It could have it could have used some kind of like because we have the the little twist of the father being the father of the main cultist lady, um, so you have some sort of background stories in terms of the humans that are responsible. A um, great dad, by the way. Ah, <laughs> uh, you know, I think he could have done better. I think he probably could have done better. Um, I also have mixed feelings about that character. I'm like, you're like the worst priest ever like you <laughs> this is why you retired right because you fucking suck dude you could have stopped all of this and i i think for him his whole thing to land a little bit more that's why i probably would have liked a little bit more information about the main cultist and him they have a moment where he kind of explains like you know i taught her my work but then you know be careful of how your work might be you know interpreted or used by your kids i enjoyed that line a little bit i think i could have used maybe five more minutes of them um it's just to feel how more tragic it is for her to then kill her father. You know, you could have had a 
Kylo Ren Ben moment of them on the bridge and it being real maybe hard for her to do that maybe ultimately easy because of what she's trying to do but i would have that i think that could have hit a little bit harder um if they actually had a little bit more information about those characters um also i was happy he died <laughs> he was a dick yeah i hate that it's like it happens in a lot of movies it's like things could have been solved if x happened but this this one rubbed me the wrong way too. Just it, it's like the priest just didn't tell them, "Hey, I you, we can cut out fifty five minutes of the movie. The altar's downstairs, guys. She's we just fucking light it up. Let's do it. I you know I should have destroyed it before. My bad. Come down to the basement. We'll destroy it together. And then it's like the, the for the rest of the movie, which is like more than half of the movie, to be tied on him not saying that thing, being who he was. I could have only justified if I knew like the the depths of his own fatherhood to the the cultists like and you have to assume and he's the father he loves her he said that they had the moment but i'm like for the rest of the movie to be tied because of the priest didn't tell them that we can stop evil by destroying the altar i don't know i didn't like it i didn't like it. I'm, I'm glad he died too but it was like this movie i don't know i think it needed a little bit of more plotting in that area as to why everyone's still going through some fucked up stuff they they needed to either develop that those characters a little bit more for it to hit better with me or to come up with a different plot device as to why he, you know, didn't tell them about the altar below. Yeah, no, he was, he was the worst. I, I didn't, I was so happy. Like I said, when he got his throat slip, I was like, am I supposed to feel bad for him? Um, I feel like, I feel like this is exactly what I wanted to happen. Um, so that was one of the few instances where I rooted for the main villain of the movie. Uh, cause he was the least likable character. He was the the one most deserving to die. I'm not gonna lie. Um, so that was perfectly valid. That was a big gripe of mine as well. Um, but in terms of the finale, man, comparing it to the other two Conjuring films, did you feel like that finale was good enough, or did you feel like it, they could have done more? Uh, I, yeah, I didn't care much about the finale actually. I think the stronger moments of the, I mean the strongest moment was the first moment of, of this movie for sure um and then you had the character interactions that I enjoyed but this one it had some good points to it it's just like it it was Ed wielding a sledgehammer uh against Lorraine which from a character's perspective perspective I I enjoyed cuz that's you know that's a hard thing to watch these two like known lovers just you know almost like one killing the other um and then meanwhile laying down the hammer man laying down the hammer for his wife sludging it up judge sledge uh and then you have it paralleled with what was happening in the prison which you have like another priest trying to hold shit down with arnie while debbie's trying to stop him from killing himself via the demon um yeah it was it was a little weak for my taste because really uh i just i just felt like there could have been more happening like you have this occultist who can you know, just mess with the mind. She does that and seems to have these demonic monsters at least appear in people's minds, at least maybe in real life. It's hard to tell what was real, what was not. But even in like the Annabelle movie, which the first one I, I really don't like, but they had these creatures as surrogates to the the powers of, of the demon. So I felt like they could have had some like sub bosses of sorts like that they had to get through and versus it literally and it was it felt so easy it felt so easy ultimately it was like like why aren't you there guarding that altar too girl like step up like <laughs> like that's the only thing that can stop you is the altar being destroyed why, why is it so indefensible apparently like you're betting on another warren to just kill this warren maybe you know sure up your your offensive line here and uh and you know guard it so like if she got taken down with a sledgehammer to a table that was the ultimate finale so yeah it, it was probably bottom tier finales in terms of the other conjuring movies for me at least i agree yeah and i was i was actually gonna say that i i really love the style of this movie i thought that the premise was really good that's why i place it above the second one but I think it, this one had the opposite problem of my problems with the second Conjuring movie. Where I thought the second Conjuring movie, they tried to do too much. And they made it too grandiose. And it looked silly at times because of how over the top it was. Um, but this one had the opposite problem. It was They, they did too little at the end. Um, and I understand they wanted to do a more human adversary. Uh, but at the same time, 
this woman was literally using magic to like teleport and like move through the shadows and commanded demon you would think she would have better a better idea of how to defend her altar um ultimately being the only source of her weakness and she was she was she murked her father pretty easily you would think she w- would have done a better job of like maybe injuring Lorraine or Ed or whatever she there was just too much do sex machina going on I, I didn't like it yeah. and at the end when they destroy the altar it's very anticlimactic I, I at least expected to see the true form maybe of the demon or something like that but it's literally her contorting and the demon walking up and like tapping her head and she dies because it takes her soul um, and then that's it. And then they, you know, they do this really loving romantic moment at the end with the heart locket that we talked about, but, uh, they could have definitely done more. Um, and I think, and I, I think they put all their eggs in the intro basket cause the intro was really scary and it was really well done. But then the end of it was just, it's over. Cool. Let's move on with our lives. So <laughs> that to me was a, was kind of a big problem, um, with the film, but in terms of scariness, like just pure horror right how much it scared you how many horrific moments were in it do you think that how does it how does it compare to the first two conjuring films do you think it was the least scary um somewhere in the middle or most scary uh the first opening scene just gives it a lot of points um so that's probably like it probably has the best scene out of all the conjurings with that one alone um if you're looking at you know the rest of the movie I think it has less, at least for me. I think, like The Conjuring 2, my criticism of it is the same as yours. I have it as less of a criticism, but it's the same. It's they, It felt like they're like, all right, what other IPs can we potentially spin off in this movie? That's what it felt like, ultimately. And I think a lot of the gripe came from The Crooked Man, who I th- do think can be a, a creepy thing. But they, if they just got rid of The Crooked Man, then it would have been a better movie already. Um, and I, I think... Th- the Conjuring one and two focusing on a family and having like some of those kids as a focal points as who you want to save and it being so helpless seeing like mothers and cry because they can't save their baby girl from these fucked up demonic happenings. I think those all inherently had some scarier moments whether uh, versus uh, the too little of scenes we had with our uh, uh, who's the who's the little boy in this one David is it David David yeah David Glass yep. Like David could have took you know more of a focal point, and I think it would have been, uh, we would have been invested in his vulnerability a little bit more, and probably would have been more scared, versus seeing uh, Arnie being haunted mostly in the prison, um, and then the ending didn't have too many like this movie did have some good scares in it, but ultimately, after the first scene, which you know set the tone beautifully, didn't feel that scary for a lot of the other scenes. This movie was actually funnier. I think than a lot of the other movies and not even in a bad way. They just, they just had some good writing in terms of things being funnier. Um, but you know what? They had really great character moments. They developed some new characters in fun ways. Uh, the lore at least that initially seemed pretty cool. Cool. We have like a throwback to another, uh, group of people who existed in the previous movie. They're showing, you know, maybe the fruits of their labor since that first animal movie in this occultist who has the same powers as the Warren cool but the payoff wasn't there and then I, I personally i didn't feel the scares were there after the first scene i agree so yeah i thought i thought it was just an overall better movie slightly better than the second one um but in terms of scares i thought it was the least horror-esque one uh to me this one was more about just them as a couple it, to me this movie is a cautionary tale really about what parenting can do um you have ed and lorraine warren who despite having these cases and all these items of demonic possession in their house, they still managed to raise a very um, aware child who respects these things, but doesn't, you know, turn over to, to the more evil aspects of, of the nature of their work versus this priest who, you know, fell into the other spectrum and their kid was developing into something monstrous, so to speak. So I, I did think that was the overall message and it really focused on the Warrens and like, you know the light counteracting the dark and the power of love and that kind of stuff and it worked it wasn't it was it wasn't cheesy like i like i thought it would be like you said but um to me that's what made it a better movie than the second one um but in terms of horror definitely the least scary one not saying it's not scary um but it's definitely the least scary one of of the three main conjuring films and um 
just just some some weird gripes for me um i can't again take this with a huge grain of salt because logic is something that you shouldn't apply that much to horror films just because everything's very arbitrary with paranormal stuff right because there's no way of measuring it there's no way of like comparing it um because Proving. you know obviously yeah. ghosts are ghosts and they do what they do and you know we can't really complain about that when you watch a movie about possession and spirits but just for me there were some inconsistencies in the movie that made no sense to me um so for instance there was um there was a scene where ed gets a, a witch's totem and he gets he he starts seeing stuff and, and getting slightly possessed and then he destroys the totem and it, he doesn't get possessed anymore but the main character arnie he is not near the witch's totem anymore and he still has instances where he's possessed which made no sense to me and for whatever reason and i don't know how accurate this is to real life but they really shit on like catholic priests in this movie like they don't help at all right the holy water doesn't work the exorcism doesn't work um prayers don't work i mean none of the things that they typically do had any effect in this movie which is so strange to me because like what was what's the message there like Unless they destroyed the altar, there was nothing they could do to stop the witch. I mean, yep. maybe Lorraine had that one moment where she freezes the witch because of her psychic abilities, but then it worked. Like they said, there's a two-way street on that. So to me, to me, it was kind of like weird. Like the logic was kind of weird. Like nothing else worked. Um, and I don't know. I just it just like compared to what you see in the Conjuring films previous to this, you would at least just expect it to like aid a little bit but it almost seemed like none of that had any bearing in this film like none of that was important uh which was just strange i don't know if you had the same yeah, vibe from that it's it's interesting because it's kind of like uh like the warrens are like the best at what they do um but i'm like i feel like what they do is pretty accessible to everyone else in their fi- in their field right like i don't I understand why the priests can't level up their shit to to the same way they are like like obviously Lorraine's the most powerful one, but that still puts in work with his chance and stuff. He puts people back to sleep, you know, uh, back to hell. I yeah, I don't understand why that's not in this world where that is an explicit truth. You know, start some training regimens. You know, throw throw some priests some bone and have them uh, have some tools to do some same. Like yeah, they should have just an army of priest homies who could just do the same thing. It doesn't seem like, you know, like Ed's not special. He he has a special wife. He knows some spells. Why, why, why don't they? If if evil is so present, that should be like, you know, all right, 101 priest, like how to put a demon back to the depths of hell. We're going to go through that in the syllabus and we'll have a final test on that. Um, yeah, it is, exactly. it is a weird difference between like what the rest of that lore of Catholicism offers their priests because like apparently they can't do shit. And um, it's except for the priest's dad who was retired. He could have just destroyed the altar, but that, that's more like a construction worker couldn't stop this demon than a you know priest exactly. magic. <laughs> exactly, and it made again it made no sense because Ed broke out of the spell because of the power of love. Is it to be implied that Arnie was less in love? I mean, I, yep. I don't. Yep. Like, that's just a flaw in it for me. <laughs> that's, and that's, what uh, <laughs> that's it, yeah, you just you didn't love hard enough. That's what happened. Um, and I'm listen. I I'm not saying I sh- I'm shitting on this movie and I don't like it, but to me that was just a weird thing. Yeah. Um, and it's that that tends to be an inconsistency in the Conjuring films because if you look at any of the spin-off movies, they make the nun, they make Annabelle look like these really powerful things. Like the main characters in those spin-off movies are very helpless. Like they Yeah. They don't hold off any of those things very well. I'm not gonna spoil those movies for you, you should go and watch them. But then in the main Conjuring movies, Ed and Lorraine Warren kind of deal with them pretty easily. Um, and they have no church affiliate, like they, they work with the church, but they're not a priest and they, they don't work with the Catholic church, um, in their, yeah, they're, inner they're freelancers, you know, they're yeah, freelancers. Yeah. Exactly. So they, that's always, that's always been so weird for me. Like if you look at the first Annabelle movie, I know you didn't like it, but they make Annabelle the spirit, like really demonic, really powerful, really scary. Like none of these people would have survived had it not been for, you know, plot device at the end of that movie. But then in in the Conjuring movies, they deal with Annabelle pretty easily, like compared to the the folks in those films. Uh, same thing with the Nun. Uh, for those who have seen the Nun, it literally takes and again, spoiler for the Nun here, an ancient relic 
from biblical times to cast the demon Valak back to hell. And in The Conjuring 2, it's just like, I know your name. I send you back to hell. And then it goes back to hell. So, um, yeah. and Lil Wayne Warren are just too OP. That's that's what I'm getting from these films. Um, but that's always been weird for me. Like, the power scaling in The Conjuring universe just makes no sense. Yeah. And I usually have a problem with, like, the power of love conquering all kind of thing. Because, like, again, it's like this weird, unmeasurable thing where it's like, you just got to love a little bit harder. And then you can break the spell of a really powerful witch who's done, you know, decades of studying of how to possess people. It's like, yeah, but you you didn't count for the power of love, though, man. Like, that's you didn't add that in your formula. That was an anime that, style. Yeah, it's always a weird one. I'd rather them do some arbitrary spell thing, you know, some kind of ritual for them to do, for them to get out of their situation than just like, just love me. Remember the gazebo. Remember. Um, again, they do the same thing in The Conjuring <laughs> 1, too. Do they? I, I forget about that. I forget about that. Is yeah, just, like at the end, she'll put she put her hand on like the possessed woman, the mother's head. She's like, remember your family. Remember uh, the beautiful times. Yeah. yeah. It's been a while for that one. Yeah, they do. It's too OP. It is. Love is too... And, you know, it's at the very least, at least they always have love at the, the core of the movie. So when they use it as a solution, okay. There's some through lines where it's not complete nonsense. It's nonsense. It's just not complete nonsense. Or too much of a detriment to, you know, tank the movie completely. Uh, but it is annoying. It is annoying. I think... Um, I think for me, it's, it's weird seeing these movies, all of them, because they follow cases that have, you know, happened in the general word of happened. Um, and for me, like, you know, I'm not a man of God at all. I'm, I'm a, I'm a straight up heathen. So it's, it's weird to like, it's true. Check out our other podcasts. If you don't believe us, <laughs> like I, in you know, accepting the universe's truth in the movie, then I can like, I can just accept all this. Like, Oh, I don't want Arne to be locked up. Like it was a demon. I saw it in that last scene, but like the real life version of that, it's like, I don't think that happened. So I'm not actually, I'm not rooting for Arnie like in my heart. Cause I'm like, dude, you just fucking stabbed someone. Like I, I definitely think some kind of psychosis happened, but like you, like you, you need to be locked up and treated like that's, so that's my, my conclusion is like, no, he need like when he looks back at Lorraine, like, Oh no, I don't know what's going to happen. I'm like, I hope it's, you get locked up, like not death sentence, but you, you, you probably need more than five years, my dude. So that's always like a weird thing too, where like, like they're, like there are real families who have had tragedies happen to them, and it's weird to then twist that into like this horror fantasy of like, but what if everything that they said actually happened? And I get that from like a storytelling per perspective, but I'm like, I don't know, like Arnie needs to be locked the fuck up. Like he needs to be in, in some kind of better Arkham Asylum than uh, the. I was Arkham actually gonna Arkham say that. I was gonna yeah. say, damn, Randy, you want to send him to Arkham? <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, better because you know Bruce Wayne doesn't help anyone either. But <laughs> he clearly needed treatment for a long time, I felt. Uh, so it's always weird watching these movies. I'm like, I want to root for you in the fiction. But then, like, also, I, in real life, I want you to still be locked up. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, weird, it's a weird thing to, uh, to swallow with these movies. <laughs> yeah. And um, honestly, I think all in all, I thought it was a decent film. Uh, it is a great addition to the Conjuring universe. Um, you could do far worse, like I said. Um, at the end of the day, like I said, I give Conjuring 1 uh, an 8.5 to a 9. It's a sliding scale. Um, Conjuring t or Conjuring 2, I give like a 7 to a 7.5. Actually, uh, yeah, 7 to 7.5. I would give The Conjuring the Devil Made Me Do It like a 7 to a 7.6. But it's it's like neck and neck. It's very close. It's very close. Uh, but overall, solid film, man. What about you? Yeah, I think I give yeah, Conjuring One's probably a uh between eight and eight and a half. Um I will probably just I'll round to eight, like a really super solid eight. Uh Conjuring two, I'd probably give that one I'd give that one a seven point two five and then I give the devil made me do it a seven. I think that's how I I'll grade those. So I mean again, two and three similar ratings, but for different reasons as we talked about. Two's you know, scarier. There's a lot, lot more things going on in terms of like, all right, these seem pretty formidable foes. Uh, three is probably like better written in a lot of ways. You know, character is pretty good. Uh, I think, um, like if this is like for me the worst the main Conjuring movies can do, then like, yeah, I want more. Like it, the the spinoffs they can get pretty bad, sure. <laughs> 
But these main ones, as long as they have these main characters at the heart of the film, it's hard for it to be bad because you love the character, so the stakes are always there for you. Um, and they do, every movie conjures up some kind of really horrific scene and set piece that you know really sticks with you. So as long as the movies keep doing that, yeah, bring on more of them. Um, in terms of like the future of the, of the Conjuring verse, what, what would you want to happen next? Is there like a movie from a story you know of that you want to see or just something that's in development? Um, or do you want it to end? I, like maybe this is the end of The Conjuring. You, you got all the goods you can. We're done. I think, um, I think, like I said, a prequel would be really cool to see prequel, yeah. about the Warrens when they're young. Um, I'd love to see that as a show, actually, more than I would like a movie because I feel like you need time to develop the, char- the characters and the, the relationship they build because um, that's goals, man. That, that, that love, that takes time. That takes time and effort. You can't, you can't squeeze that into one film. True that, true um, that. But that would be cool. Um, and then I would actually like to see more films from the young daughter's perspective um, because they do it a little bit in Annabelle Comes Home, but she's also a girl with abilities and she helps out significant. She's the main character in that third Annabelle movie, but I'd actually like to see her more involved with, you know, just her experiences as a kid growing up underneath the Warrens. Um, cause that's, that's an interesting childhood that I would like to learn about. Um, just having parents sure. who are yeah. world renowned paranormal investigators. Um, so I'd love to, and they show her when she's older in this film. Um, so I'd like to see that those in between years a little bit more. Um, but again, that could also work as a TV show. So those are the two really big things I'd like to see from the conjuring universe. Um, and even perhaps if you want to go future route, um, you know, this is a spoiler just for life in case you didn't know it. Ed dies before Lorraine Warren dies uh, much earlier. Um, so you could even do a movie about him passing and her still trying to help people and work as a psychic, even though she's grieving that she doesn't have her husband with her anymore. Um, and they could do something beautiful about him being there in spirit and, you know, that love never really fading away. That would be wonderful. And I'd like to see something like that, too. What about you? Yeah, I think the last one, I, I'd vote for that one out of the other ones you said. Those are all good ideas. I, but I do love the idea of Lorraine is trying to, to hold it down by herself. And, you know, like how does, she, how do, how does the film still manage to show their love um, without both of them being there? I think that could be some powerful grieving scenes that they can write in there. Um, her, you know, maybe not even being on top of her game at first, but really finding it in her to... Um, do what they both love to do, which was to help people. Um, I really like, because I was also thinking maybe they'd do it in, um, partly in this movie, but they didn't have time to. But when the the retired shitty priest mentions, like, you know, be careful what you pass down to your kids. You don't know how they can take it. Uh, I want that to be a much harder illusion. I do want them to, like, struggle with their daughter's exposure to all these fucked up stuff that they encounter daily um, and really see like the negative ramifications and like what they can do to marry protecting their family um, while also keeping them involved in helping people. So I think that could be some interesting stakes to like put in, you know, the daughter more in like one of the main casting, but then the mother really, and the, you know, if Ed's still there in the next movie, them really trying to figure out what's the balance between good parenting and having our kid develop in the way they want to develop. So I think that'd be interesting uh, route to go as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but yeah, solid film series. Look forward to to more of it. Very solid. Um, let us know. Very solid. Yeah. Let us know in the comment section which one of the Conjuring films you really love, any particular moments you really love, what parts you thought were the scariest, what you'd like to see. You know, anything maybe that we didn't know about Evan Lorraine Warren in real life, let us know in the comment section. We love to hear from you guys. We love to hear your opinions about what we say. If you think we're just blatantly wrong on something, tell us. We can we can talk about it later. We we love we love messages from you guys. So for sure. Um until then, man, you know, yeah. there's only one thing left to do. Yeah, it's been uh been great getting back at it. Um with ATA vibes and we have I mean, there's a lot we haven't reviewed yet. They're just on our docket list. So definitely stay tuned for the next After the Act episode. You can keep up with us right here, right where you're watching us, whether it's Twitch or YouTube. Uh, Please follow, like, subscribe to our channel, and you'll be notified when we're uh, back on it, whether we're gaming, doing a movie review, or, you know, shooting a shit on the Conch podcast. 
follow, like, subscribe there. You can follow all of our work at malinpictures.com as well, uh, where you can see all of our podcasts and streaming platforms and, you know, personal film updates as well. Uh, feel free to send us a message uh, on Facebook at Malin Pictures or at After the Act or at The Magic Cons. You can find our Facebook pages on Facebook. You can send us a message on MalinPictures.com. Wherever you want us, we're there with you, baby. Spotify, iTunes, SoundCloud, Google Play. We're here for you. We're here with you for the summer. We're back. We're going to be putting these back out here. So stay tuned to the next spooky edition of After the Act. Take care. We love you. Bye-bye.